bacteria are switching from one to another, even if, in this case, if one of the bacteria is dead, right? So if it's passing on a gene, passing on genetic information um, to another bacteria, in this case, transforming the non-virulent bacteria into virulent bacteria, right? Uh, so at this point in history, we don't, in science history, we don't know yet whether the gene is um, protein or DNA, and again, that's what the next couple of experiments in the packet are dealing with. And I know we started talking about this experiment, but uh, I know we didn't finish yet. So, take a look at part B. So this is, looks like a pretty complicated diagram. Uh, we're starting with that same virulent bacteria from Griffith's experiment. We centrifuge it. Again, what does centrifuging do? Separate. Yes. Separate the base so the, the um, bacterial cells are going to go to the bottom, and then what they're dissolved, the medium's going to be at the top, right? We heat it up to kill it. Yep. To be nature of the proteins that killed it. We blend it up. We extract all the other extracellular stuff, so the carbohydrates, the lipids, any enzymes, extra stuff. And so what we end up with is just the genetic material. And this first round is a test of control. So they take that filtrate, they add it to the non-virulent cells, and what happens? Transformation, so we know that we we know that they extracted the genetic material. We know that it can cause transformation. Okay, so that's the whole point of that. Okay, so take a couple seconds in your group. Talk about the rest of this. What happens when they treat it with that protease enzyme, the ribonuclease, the deoxyribonuclease? And what do you think the importance of that is? Because if we destroy the proteins completely, the transformation still happens. Does that make sense? We treat it with ribonuclease. What does that do? Destroys the RNA, so breaks it apart into teeny tiny little nucleotides, right? 
And what we end up with is transformation still happens. So what does that tell us? It's not the RNA. Okay. We treat it with deoxyribonuclease, which does what? Breaks down the DNA in a teeny tiny nucleotide. And at that point, the transformation can't happen anymore. Okay. So that tells us that the transformation has to be caused by the DNA. Okay. And so this is a good experiment. So a lot of times in science, you can't just, correlation's not enough. You actually have to go through and like, uh, process of elimination and knock out all the possibilities, right? So that's what this experiment did. They knocked out the idea that it was protein, they knocked out the idea that it was RNA, and they show that when you destroy the DNA, the transformation can happen. So take a couple seconds if you need to to um, write anything, any notes down there before you move on. <laughs> Especially that last, what conclusions about transformation can we make based on these results? Isotopes as tracers. One is 
sulfur 35 and one is phosphorus 32. So take a look at that first question. Talk about that in your group. What are we tagging with those two? Back to your uh, structure of macromolecules. Okay. So the, 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 when they made the protein for radioactive, they, they did the radioactivity to go to bacteria. But when they went with the DNA radioactive, when it was injected into the DNA, to the bacteria. Thank <laughs> you. 
something you might have learned about in middle school. So we're getting away from infecting organisms. And we're just doing some chemical analysis of DNA. So Chargoff did a lot of DNA extractions from various different organisms. So basically any organism he could get his hands on. He isolated some DNA. And he determined the ratio of the bases. So he was able to isolate adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, and calculate the respective percentages of each one of those bases. Okay. So here's some data that he accrued for, for human DNA. So take a look at that. What does this data tell you about the ratio of nucleotides? Thank <laughs> you. 
share the same here. Yep. <coughs> yep. There's roughly equal amounts of A and T and roughly equal amounts of C and D. We know now because that's because the, these are the base pairs, right? So anytime we have an A across from a T, at the time they didn't have that model yet, but they did, they were able to figure out that there's about equal proportions of A and T is equal to C. There's a math problem there at the bottom. See if you can calculate that. Yeah. 